Welcome to Radio System Design, Module 12, Nonlinearity, Intermodulation, and OIP3. Today we're going to talk about the definition of intermodulation and specifically about the uh, metric OIP3 and how we calculate that. Uh, it's an important metric for uh, distortion and intermodulation. So why do we care about intermodulation? We've seen that communication systems often use uh, the available frequency bands in multiple bands to transmit uh, signals in multiple channels. And so what happens to these signals when the transmitter exhibits a nonlinear behavior? For ease of analysis, instead of considering uh, two channels that uh, have a full bandwidth, we're just going to approximate these as a single tone sinusoid just for ease of our analysis. Even with a simplification, there is going to be a lot of math. You can go back and follow it as we go along, but um, just be prepared. All right, so what we've done is we've shown, as we've seen before, two inputs to a system, A1 cosine omega 1 plus A2 cosine omega 2. And we put these through a nonlinear amplifier that has a Taylor series, and just remember that Y is equal to alpha 1 a in plus alpha 2 a in squared plus alpha 3 a in cubed and so forth. And what we've done is we've multiplied all of that out. So here you can see this is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. And we've multiplied everything out and what I've done is shown you two pieces. The first piece is what happens to the fundamentals. So you can see that the fundamentals have their linear gain and they also have the gain that we saw before, a nonlinear gain, but that's still representative of their um, original amplitudes. But then they have these terms here which are intermodulations. So if you look this is A2 whereas this is the A1 cosine. The second thing we get and this is uh, one of the big effects, is that we end up with two tones at 2 omega 1. Let's say this is 0. So let's go to 2 omega 1. So this is 2 omega 1 minus omega 2. Okay? And then we're going to take 2 omega 2, 2 omega 2 minus, oh, sorry, I drew that wrong. This is 2 omega 1 minus omega 2, and here's 2 omega 2 minus omega 1. And what you see is here is we've got these two sidebands adjacent to our two initial signals, and their uh, amplitudes are a result of the coefficients that we see here. These are called uh, third order intermodulation products, and if you're wondering why third order, you can see that you actually have a cubed term right here from the two amplitudes, and we'll look at that more specifically in the next couple of slides. Intermodulation three products do not interfere with the main tones, so the question is why would we be worried? And as you've probably seen before, it's because they interfere with the adjacent channels. A lot of times in our systems, what's different about RF than maybe some other uh, analog circuit design is we're not only worried about how what we care about works, but we're also worried about not disturbing things around us because of the limited bandwidth and the fact that other people are using channels around us. And so here's a nice cartoon if these are our two input signals, and this is our friend, Omega Not trying to transmit, if we have this intermodulation product, it will actually throw down and interfere right there on omega naught and transmit it and disturb our friend as they're trying to happily communicate at omega naught. And so they're both uh, troublesome for the transmitter and in the receiver. So let's characterize these intermodulation uh, uh, products so that we can quantify them and uh, have an ability to characterize how good or bad a system is with respect to creating these intermodulation projects. So we generate a test signal for our intermodulation characterization and what we do is we use a test signal uh, that simply has our two input signals that we used before and what we've done is we've made them have the same amplitude right? 
And I've just defined omega-2 equal to omega-1 plus delta omega. And that's for convenience that we'll see later. Um, really, the only caveat that's changed is we've said, okay, they've got the same amplitude. And so uh, here's our assumptions. And this is called a two-tone test because we're putting in basically two tones with the same amplitude. And we're going to measure the intermodulation product that comes out. And so um, I want to take for a second and go back to our expansion that we had before. And I just want you to look at this aspect right here and this aspect right here for the two assumptions that we have. All right. Okay. And the one assumption was that A1 equals A2. And the second one is, is that omega-2 equals omega-1 plus delta omega. So let's look at these two with that. So our output is going to be equal to alpha-1 plus 3 quarters alpha-3 three plus 3 halves alpha-3 times a cubed times cosine omega 1 t. Now why I was able to do that? Well this a1 is the same as a2 is the same as a1 so I can just multiply this in here and multiply this in here I get a cubed a cubed and I can just pull that up. Likewise I can do the same thing for the second one alpha 1 plus 3 quarters alpha 3 plus 3 halves alpha 3 a cubed cosine omega 1 plus delta omega okay t and uh, I can simplify this if I need to it simply is going to be 9 fourths alpha 3 okay so now let's go take a look at this down here, this first one. So plus, I'm going to have 3 fourths alpha 3 a cubed cosine 2 omega 1 minus omega 1 minus delta omega where I've just substituted in this here, right? And this is going to give me omega 1 minus delta omega. And then I can do the other one, 3 quarters alpha cubed a cubed cosine. And this is going to be 2 omega 2 minus omega 1. And this is going to be 2 omega 1 plus 2 delta omega minus omega 1 and this is going to then be omega 1 plus 2 delta omega okay so if I change my colors real quick I'll just highlight these I have this term is there this term is there this term is there and then finally this top term is there. All right, so that's how we've derived it. Uh, if it looks a little messy, that's okay. Watch. We can clean it up. I wanted to just show you how we've gotten to this point where the 9 fourth comes from, where the plus 2 delta and where the minus delta comes from. And so now what you can see is we've got omega 1, right? And we've got a tone at omega 1, omega 1 plus delta, that's that one omega 1 plus 2 delta there we go and here is omega 1 minus delta so you can see got that got that got this one and then finally that one there okay and uh, we've just assumed that we filtered out everything but these uh, frequencies so you can see we've got everything there and um, because the delta omega was fixed here the frequency separations are nice and clean and uh, before we reach any kind of gain compression the main tones grow with a so these increase with a and these two 
increase with a cubed. Okay, and you're saying, but wait, doesn't the main tones, or don't the main tones, have an a cubed component? They do, but what you need to notice is that we're assuming, first of all, a3, or sorry, alpha 3 is very small, but we're also assuming that we're well before compression, so the amplitude is actually small. So if I've got a and an a cubed term, for a being very small, I basically can ignore the second term because of this dominates. Here, however, a3 is the entire term, so I can't ignore it, and this dominates for these coefficients. So what we're saying is, if you think about it, very small signals were dominated by the uh, voltage is going to increase with a for the main tones and with a cubed for the side tones, even though the side tones are very small. Now, you probably can imagine from previous modules, the problem here is that these harmonics start to grow faster than um, the main tones at a small level. Obviously, once we start to get to a big input level, we can't ignore this tone, and we've got to take into account the A cubed that's there. But let's just go back and look at small inputs and the trends that happen. So if you recall from the previous lecture, this is a PN, P-out plot where we're using 20 log of the voltages. Okay, so it's a power plot, but if you remember on the previous slide, we were talking about the voltages, and so uh, the difference there is whether we're using 20 log or 10 log. So the top line right here shows the uh, power of the main tone, and we know from before that its slope is just going to be 1, right? And the gain of the amplifier is this offset, okay? This line, okay, it shows the IM3 products. If you notice right away, its slope is 3. If you're wondering, well, why 3? Well, remember, if I take the log of, let's just take a number um, b cubed, right? The We're going to end up with 3 log of b. Right? So as my input moves 1, my output's going to move 3 because of this prefactor. And remember, we're looking at the third order product, and that's why there's a cube there. So this line's moving up. Now you notice, I haven't shown anything up here where compression happens. We're just looking at small signals down here. All right, and the other thing we look at is that these lines right here tell us the difference between the two. And if you notice, that difference is reducing. And the whole idea behind a characterizing intermodulation is to make believe that this trend continues, and eventually there's a crossing point. Now, what do I mean by make believe? Well, in reality, before any of this would happen, this would compress, right? So what we're assuming here is that we're at small signals where these are still following the trends of 1 to 1 and 1 to 3, and then we just imagine where are they going to meet. And um, before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about how these two lines come close to one. Let's take a look at the difference. So if we measure the relative IM3 to be minus 25 dBc. Let's just look at that for a second. dBc, remember that's dB relative to the carrier. Remember that? By definition, the difference is dBc. This is omega naught, or omega 1, and this is 3 omega 1. So by definition, the difference is dBc. And an output power of 20 dBm. So that means our power output is 20 dBm and we measure a difference of 25 dBc. The question is, what is the difference going to be at um, an input power of 22? Now, it's written out here, but I want to go over it really slowly here. So P1 is increased by 2 dB, right, because we've gone from 20 to 22. IM3 is increased by 6 dB, why is that? Because the input went up 1, 2, so this went up 6, right? Because it has a slope of 3. The difference increased by 4 dB. So the new answer is that the uh, IM3 
3 would be equal to minus 21 dBc. Now, here's the gotcha, and I'll go ahead and write it for you. Okay? The difference delta changes by 2 dB per 1 dB increase. Okay? So that means if I go up 1 dB, the difference delta, it goes up. It reduces, the delta reduces by minus uh, 2 dB. C in this case, right? So right, we go up by 2, we end up with a 4 decrease. So let's just play that game. If I keep on going up 1, 1, 1, 1, when will these two intersect? Well, if my difference is, let's take our example, let's say my IM3 is equal to minus 22 dBC, right? I know that I lose two of these every 1 dB that I increase in input power. So let me just take 22 and divide it by 2, that equals 11. And so that means if Pn increases by 11 dBm, then my Im3 will be equal to 0. And how did I figure that out? I just did it through geometry, by the fact that this is decreasing 2 dB for every 1 dB increase in input power. And so when we want to specify the IM3 level, we always need to specify it at a specific output power level. And as I showed you before, and we've gotten to this several times, we describe the intersection of these as the third intercept point. And it happens because these two intersect here. And I just want to emphasize, once again, we're calculating it from a power that's much lower than anything near the distortion. So we're ignoring any of the actual distortion. In fact, this intercept point could be higher than your 1 dB compression point. And this just has to do with the fact that it's an extrapolation from small signals. So we could talk about the input intercept point, and so this is just what input amplitude is uh, uh, this intersect point at, so that would be the IIP3, or we could talk about the output intersect point, or the OIP3. Either one tell us about the same point. And the OIP3 is simply the IIP3 plus the gain, and that's just our definition of PN plus G equals P out, right? That's all we're saying with that. And now we come to the final equation. You can calculate OIP3 from any given power, P1, right? And you use this formula, delta P, right? And you multiply it by 0.5. And I'll just explain that once again. You put in a power, so typically somebody will say the I am 3 equals minus 21 dBc. Well, I am 3 is equal to delta P, P1, and as we said before, I've got to tell you where this is at. I can't just give you a number. When P out equals 20 dBm. This is just an example. So P1 equals 20 dBm. So I've got P1, I've got delta P, here's my formula. Where did this point 0.5 come from? That's why we went at length before to explain this. For every 1, 1 dBm increase in Pn, delta P reduces by 2 dB. So what we do is we take delta P, we divide it by 2, and that tells us the delta P in to get to the OIP3 point. Okay? Once again, just using the slopes and the geometries there. So here's the equation that you can use, but I always get confused about where does this one half come from, and it comes from 
the fact that the difference changes by 2 dB per 1 dB of input, even though this is increasing by 3. The confusing part is this increases by 3, this increases by 1, and you need to realize that the different differential increase is just 2 dB. All right, that's it for our definition on intermodulation and also how we can calculate the OIP3 or the IIP3. And just remember that formula has the trick of its 2 dB, 2 dB decrease of the difference between the intermodulation and the main tone for every 1 dB increase. If you remember that, you'll understand where the 1 half comes from in the equation and you'll be able to calculate everything.